Hey, how's everybody doing out there? Hope everybody's doing well. Coming off of the 4th of July weekend, as well as um, I think it was Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. Polynesian Pip, Aloha, Magic Man, how you doing? Um, if you guys can, can you give me feedback on the sound? Is um, the audio coming in okay for you guys? Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, blase, blase. Anybody invest, I need guidance. Uh, we got one clip. Somebody's going to tell you what you perhaps might be looking at. Um, might want to stick around for that. Map of Tassie, how you doing? Long time no see, my man. Hope everything there is going okay for you. Mr. Tim Tam, I like your chocolates. Those are good chocolates, Tim Tams. Who runs the banking system? It's not me. I can tell you that much. <laughs> RR, who watches the watchers? I think we all need to become watchers. Keep an eye on everyone. Max Headroom, how you doing? Southern California, Grow Mechanic, Michigan in the house. How you doing? Max Frost. Uh, Tony. How you doing? Magic Man again. Polynesian Pit. Bill Gavin. Uh, can you talk about King Gold Bars and Chinese Shadow Banks? I think we'll, we we we'll probably will touch on those, those gold bars. I pulled up an article on that. Um, so let's see. Yeah, Silver Futures, 1835. Okay. Real Mechanic, 5-5. Five, five. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Paul and Pit. RR, thank you. Jeff, 702, Stack Silver. Absolutely. Thomas Toops, how you doing? Anthony Pretlow, sounds good. Thank you. First time I've seen you here. Welcome aboard, Anthony. Sydney Lewis, same. I haven't seen you before. Welcome aboard. QD, Quantitative Disease. Thank you for that. And here we go again. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. This is our weekly live stream where hopefully we can get through it without too many technical glitches or too many glitches by the host as well. <laughs> anyway, glad you all could be here again. Uh, happy 4th of July weekend for guys in the States. Happy, I believe, Canada Day for you guys up in Canada as well. You had a, a weekend um, celebrations as well. So hope it all was good for you. Europe. Thank you guys for being here. I know it's pretty early in the morning for you. Um, thanks for being here. And over in Asia, it's Monday morning, about 9.03 Singapore time. So glad you glad you could be here as well. Um, hang, let me check on something really quick. Something seems to be um, going down first thing in the morning. Jeez. Um, let me check on something real quick. I'll, I'll put you guys on pause and then I'll, I'll be I'll be right back. Okay, thanks. Hang on, hang on. Okay, well, sorry about that. If you can believe that, my power adapter just froze on me. Just talked about technical difficulties or just fried on me. So, um, luckily I had a spare. Jeez, sorry about that, guys. Anyway, how are you doing? Glad you all could, could be here. That's always a great way to start the morning, right? Have some technical difficulties. So let me look through these, um, through some, these comments real quick. Um, let's see. Uh, Jeff, 702. How much is the scales uh, the safe house has made? I'm I'm not sure on that price, but I know they're um the development is is it's going good. I think they're just wrapping things up still with it um getting the final touches in there, the final tolerations. Um and it it'll it'll be coming out I think relatively soon. Should be 
by the summer. It's July already, so it should be coming out fairly soon. Uh, it's going well. I'm not sure on the price, though. Uh, good, good question. Good question. So sorry about that uh, little glitch out there. Didn't expect it. Um, okay, so again, hope everybody out there is, is doing fine. I think you guys may be doing a little bit better than me <laughs> after that, that glitch out there. But um, let's see. Magic Man, Ralph the Fed should be buying gold. They can basically buy it for free, printed fiat. You know, that's absolutely true. Kind of makes you wonder, you know, why why they wouldn't do that. Um, well, there must be some legal reasons behind it, I'm, I'm sure. But anyway, I, I think that's all going to unfold as time as time plays out. We're going to see a few things about that that Fed, uh, what they're what's really going on there. Um, Anyway, a few more comments. Uh, abstract fitness are old silver and gold bugs giving new investors a hard time. Um, you know, I think that's a pretty interesting question because uh, the word I, I see is investors. And, and I think for these, these investors, um, they're always, I shouldn't say always, but um, they look at ways to make money. And when they look at gold and silver, um, you know, if they go back and look at a chart from, from 2011 till now, they basically see it down, 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 which does mean it's a good time to buy. You want to buy when things are low, right? But they also look at it as, you know, how am I going to make money exactly by the dip? But they look at it as how do I make money? And they see other things that have just been climbing and climbing and still in, in their view, relatively cheap to buy. So they're going to jump into those things. It, it's sort of like, you know, I guess a analogy would be when you're at a casino and you you won, you know, you're up. You want to pull some chips off the table. Some guys will do that. Other guys they'll just continue to to let it ride. There's uh, they know the Fed is is in it. They know the Fed is pushing up the markets or at least keeping the markets up. So they stay in it. They will they will stay. But for you and me, it's it's kind of a, a bittersweet thing. Um, sweet in that we can continue to buy gold and silver at that fairly low prices it is going up and a bit bitter because naturally all of us do want to see the prices rise and feel better about things but you know we'll see how how all of these these things play out but again thank you all for being here and as always if you are new to this channel or you have not already done so please do subscribe hit the bell to be notified on updates and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do we really do appreciate it the thumbs up you you guys have no idea how much that that really helps us so we appreciate the thumbs up. And again, we are on social media. You can find us at silverbullion.com.sg. We are a gold and silver dealer over in Singapore. Facebook, Silver Bullion SG. Twitter, Silver Bullion PLPL for private limited. Audio versions, bit.ly, bit.ly slash SBTV iTunes slash SBTV Spotify. And Telegram, if you have Telegram or if you don't have Telegram, go ahead and pick it up. Um, put it on your phone, put it on your desktop, your computer, laptop, and join our Crisis Tracker group. Uh, Crisis Tracker, every, every day we post two or three things that pertain to finance, economics, and of course, gold and silver. So it's a good way to um, keep up to date with, with some things and just kind of help you to get through all the, the riffraff because there's a lot more riffing and raffing these days when you when you turn on the tube so um hopefully we can help you navigate through those things um coming up this week we're going to have jeff paterson it's not patterson it's paterson he said he knows who his friends are by the way they pronounce his last name so i'm saying paterson jim paterson ceo of valor metals core and co-founder of discovery group first time guest Jim Paterson, with 22 years of industry experience, including capital raises, acquisitions, joint ventures, and IPOs, Jim was also the driving force behind more than 60, 60, 60 million in equity financings for Valor Metals Court that led to multiple discoveries. So I do hope you subscribe and hit that bell so you can be notified when Jim Paterson's interview is up. So again, it looks like Patterson, but it's really Paterson. So uh, we'll square that one away. Taking a look at uh, comments, Michael B. Yes, please smash the thumbs up button. Again, that's the biggest way you can help us out. And we really do appreciate those, those thumbs up. Um, 
those are really, really the best things you can do. So again, thank you for it. Uh, what else is out there? Greg Burdue, the Fed is buying gold. Susan Klein, how are you doing? Uh, Greg Burdue, the Fed is buying gold. You know what? I, I think they they were At the beginning of the year. I think there was a chart. Um, I I think the way I think I'm not so sure if there was, but there at the beginning of the year there was a chart where more central banks were picking up a lot more gold again at the beginning of the year. So I need to um need to check on that. Okay, what else is out there? Okay, um, <laughs> interesting comments, guys. Interesting comments. Uh, I guess we'll we'll move over and then take a look at the um Silver Bullion website and see what's going on there in uh, precious metals prices. So taking a look at it, let me refresh it really quick for you guys. Um, again, this is our website. Nickel, nickel parcels. Nickel is, um, we're pretty high on nickel because they are a component in electric vehicle batteries. Uh, one of the more important things that go into an electric car. Of course, the battery is probably the most important, but nickel is an important component of, of that battery. So we're pretty high on, on nickel. Um, it's, it's fairly low right now. As you say, by the dip right now is definitely a dip for nickel. Silver. 1810 on the move going a little bit up gold 1775 it's been kind of up and down this this morning not by much um so it, it's still um still about 1750 so that's a good thing eking forward towards 1800 and we'll see where things go i think if gold continues to go up and show some confirmation on things we're going to see silver hopefully get a bit of a slingshot so i'm i'm really looking for uh for these two guys to to move up a bit again our investor kit it is free you can download it for free just by simply clicking on this here click on it and you'll go to this pdf you take a look at it and you can download it as well this is something that um, we made up to help investors along to understand why things such as why buy gold and silver buying tax exempt bullion in singapore a lot of different things here uh, including storage accounts this one's pretty important um applying for a star storage account it is free uh, and there's no maintenance fee for it so um it is a good thing to to have for sure and again this is how you can sign up it's just one click away here as well and then we'll ask you just general questions to get you started with the storage account again no maintenance fee that's a free thing p2p peer-to-peer -peer loan rates what this is is when you do store with us you can use your gold and silver as collateral to go ahead and um, take out a secure low interest loan. And if you have a bit of cash lying around and you're not too thrilled with uh, rates, you can go ahead and create an account with us and you can go ahead and um, loan money to people who have gold and silver. So you can see here again, um, let's see. So this guy is, uh, he's looking for, um, that's Sing dollar. Let me see us dollars. Oh, a lot of Sing dollar loans right now. Okay. We'll just take a look at a Sing dollar loan. So this guy is asking for a hundred thousand. He he's asking for two years at 2.5% interest. These guys are willing to loan X amount and that's the interest rate they're willing to loan at. So I guess if you have some cash laying around, uh, there's people who are willing to, to pay to um and they have gold and silver as collateral they're willing to to use that as collateral and then you can go ahead and create your own loan amount and interest rate and see if uh if you'll match up and if they'll take it so again if you're not getting yield where you are now this is another thing to to look at for you and it is absolutely safe uh, and that is because we do check the gold and silver that comes into our vault and that's that's an important thing moving on to twitter u.s stock futures fall slightly as global coronavirus cases climb at record pace so again we're seeing the markets reacting to to what's going on with the bug so let's take a peek at this this article i'll get back to some comments after this uh, stock futures rise slightly as wall street tries to build on <laughs> sorry Wall Street tries to build on winning streak. 
um, more like uh, Fed is pumping up Wall Street. I'm always amazed how how they um, title things. You know, it, I mean, without the Fed intervention right now, uh, we're not talking about rallies. We're not talking about recoveries. We'd definitely be talking about something else. So when they want to say Wall Street is rallying, um, you got to thank the Fed. There's no rally without the Fed. U.S. stock futures traded slightly higher on Sunday night as Wall Street tried to build on the momentum of last week's solid performance. Yeah, here we go. Um, Dow Jones Industrial Average futures rose 95 points. Uh, futures gained 0.3%. And NASDAQ 100 futures advanced 0.4%. Wall Street was coming off strong gains after a shortened trading week. Due to the 4th of July holiday, Dow and S&P rose 3.3%, 4% respectively. NASDAQ advanced 4.6% uh, in that time. Uh, Sunday's gains were, were kept in check, however, as a number of bug cases kept surging globally, raising concerns about the world economy and its recovery from the pandemic. Our friends at the WHO, our friends at the WHO, uh, that more than 20 said that more than 20,000, 200,000, excuse me, coronavirus cases were confirmed over a 24 hour span. It's quite a bit. It's a record at a regional level. The biggest spike was seen in the Americas where nearly 130,000 new cases were confirmed. So I guess we're starting to see these build again. If, if that's what uh, mainstream media is putting out in the U S Florida and Texas reported daily record spikes of 11,445 and 8,000 plus respectively on Saturday. Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner said the outbreak is on pace to overwhelm the city's hospitals in two weeks. Miami Mayor Francis Suarez told ABC this weekend, it's clear that the growth is exponential at this point. So again, you know, even though the, the, the death, let's say the death numbers are going down, um, I guess what, What's the information coming out to us is that the cases are on the rise again. So it, it, it's, it's pretty interesting where you have these cases going up or confirmed cases going up, but yet the death toll or death numbers are going down. Uh, so you got to, got to kind of wonder what's going on here. You know, why, why is, uh, you would think they would have some type of a correlation there, you know, with, with cases going up, maybe that should be increasing with, with the with those cases but they're not they're going in two opposite directions so you gotta you gotta kind of wonder about that Nomi Prince the Fed and the financial regulators who stripped the Volcker rule of its meaning are enlisting the country in a two-tiered future one for the financial elite and the other for ordinary citizens of democracy are you guys seeing that I mean um over in Canada Europe uh, over in the states, are, are you guys seeing this sort of a two-tiered system coming about? Uh, even, I mean, it seems you know two-tiered, two-tiered, you know, media, two, <laughs> some media for some people, other media for others, uh, legal system, you know, some, some, uh, I guess, it, it, I mean, things are absolutely getting more and more divided, and and it is getting divided between the the have and and the have nots. And so I'm just curious if, if you guys are, are seeing this as well, or is it just something that we're, we're kind of um, fabricating on, on our own? So curious to see what you guys, what you guys have to, um, what you have to say about that. Um, so anyway, just let me take a look at some of these, these comments here. I've been hearing about this. I haven't checked on it though. Got to check on it. We have a coin shortage in the U S where are all the coins at? Um, you're not the first person who said that, and and I've seen um just a few headlines on it, but I've never really looked into it. So I'm pretty curious about that as well. Um, are there no coins? Are coins starting to to disappear? Um, you know that would be um that would be something also if if they held back uh coins or had less coins in circulation. So I'm pretty curious to to know what you guys are are seeing about that. Um. Okay. Um, Anna, Max, uh, in your opinion, what is the best path forward for an everyday payment system using gold? 
which is the best products you've seen so far? Okay, my opinion, and I am biased toward this because I, I do have a role in it, is cash, uh, cash gold, CGT, cash gold token. Reason is because I know the gold is there. It, it's and you're going to know the gold is there. It's everything is documented, and it's not the people like cash that are documenting. This is actual gold in gold vaults. The vault people, the vault operators, they are the ones uh, confirming that the gold does exist. Goes up um, on blockchain. It's verified to exist, and you know it's there. Uh, one CGT is one. Uh, one gram of gold is one CGT. But the thing is. A lot of other companies are going to tell you um, it's gold backed. But if you try and get that gold, you need to, you can't redeem it unless it's 400 ounces. Uh, with, with cash gold, it's significantly less than 400 ounces if you ever were to re redeem it. And again, you're transacting. And the thing is, again, the gold is there. It's, I, I like to say the gold is in the front, not in the back, because that gold exists before the, the token. Token comes after the gold. Other guys, sometimes you see the token first and then the gold later, somewhere down the line. And um, I'm not really, I'm not really into that. I, I want to know the gold is there first, and that's what cash gold token does. So if you ask me that question, you know, I'm going to tell you, you know, disclaimer. I am biased towards it. I do have a, have a piece of it, um, but it, it it is because this one is is the one that that I, I believe in. And I've looked at a bunch. I've, I've looked at a bunch, even had the chance to interview people who, who have their own gold back tokens. And um, CGT, cash gold token, is, is just a different thing altogether. So I do hope you, you guys take a look at it. Cash, C-A-C-H-E dot gold. Um, take a look at it. Um, you know, I'm not going to argue with guys who say if you don't hold it, you don't own it because I'm one of them. But I also understand that, you know, there's times you need to be mobile and you, you have to keep your gold mobile. And sometimes that means, yes, you have to um, put some of it in a vault or, or up on a blockchain or whatever it is with, with tokens in order to be mobile. So I understand that part of it as well. Uh, two sides, I understand. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. But I do understand the trade-off is sometimes you need to let some of it go in order to have some mobility. So there is a, a trade-off in that. Uh, good question. Good question. Um, let's see. Ryan Canning, where'd you go? His comments have been pretty, pretty quick there. Uh, very much see the two tier getting worse all the time with rapid increases coming next year or coming through the next years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm starting to see it as well. So I'm just wondering, you know, um, are we still seeing clearly through things or is this the reality where we are starting to see things divide and two tier systems in, in almost everything. So um, thank you for, uh, for giving your, your opinion on that. Okay. So getting back to um, Twitter here. Okay. So this is the Volker rule. Um, let's see. Okay. There we are. Lynette Zhang, who we had on a couple of weeks back, um, one of the best, I think the best interview we've had. Um, she's, she's, she's got some really good insight and, and opinions on things. Hyperinflation, anyone? JP Morgan concludes the world is drowning in too much debt for stocks to go down again. And we just talked about this last week, hyperinflation. So here we go. Even now the bank is saying there's just um, the world is drowning in too much debt. Stocks cannot go down. So again, you know, hyperinflation, inflation, it's real. It's, it's, um, this is what happens when you print too much. This is what happens. And let's see, does your vault test the gold and silver you store with them? And this is something that I just touched on. So we'll go ahead and take a look at this. And, um, one of you guys pointed it out, you know, it's a story about these, um, fake gold bars. So this is coming from the Asian review, the mystery of 2 billion of loans backed by fake gold in China. So I guess apparently this gold was used as some type of a collateral. And then they found out that the gold was fake. Again, this is why we test whatever comes into our vault to make sure it's real. Because if that gold goes up as collateral, 
the lender needs to be 100% positive it is true, it is real. So that's why we test it. So if you're storing in a vault that uh, doesn't test your gold and silver, how do you know you're really storing gold and silver? Because a lot of vaults, they actually will not or they don't test the gold and silver or said gold and silver that comes through their doors. So um, again, if, if you're storing in a vault and they're not testing it, I would say demand, demand that it's tested. Anyway, moving on, more than a dozen Chinese financial institutions, mainly trust companies, loaned 20 billion won or 2.8 billion over the past five years to Wuhan King Gold Jewelry Incorporated with pure gold as a collateral and insurance policies to cover any losses. King Gold is the largest privately owned gold processor in central China's Hubei province. Its shares are listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange in New York. The company is led by Chairman Jia Zi Hong, an intimidating ex-military man who is the controlling shareholder. Interesting words that they chose. What could go wrong with that, right? Well, plenty. At least some 83 tons or some of 83 tons, 83 tons, that's a big amount of gold bars used as collateral turned out to be nothing but gilded copper. That has left lenders holding the bag for the remaining 16 billion won of loans outstanding against the bogus bars. The loans were covered by 30 billion won of property insurance policies issued by state insurer PICC Property and Casual Company LTD and other smaller insurers. People are going to be on the hook for this. The fake gold came to light in February when Dongguan Trust Company LTD set out to liquidate King Gold collateral to cover defaulted debts. In late 2019, King Gold failed, failed to repay investors in several trust products. Dongguan Trust said it discovered that the gleaming gold bars were actually gilded copper alloy. This is what happens when people don't test and it goes into vaults. You just don't know what actually is going in there and you need to test it. The news sent shock waves through King Gold's creditors. China Minsheng Trust Company Limited, one of King Gold's largest creditors, obtained the court order to test collateral before King Gold's debts came due. On May 22nd, the test result returned saying the bars sealed in Minsheng's trust coffers are also copper alloy. So again, fake bars. Authorities are investigating how this happened. King Gold Chief Jia flatly denies that anything is wrong with the collateral his company put up. Okay. The case holds echoes of China's largest gold loan fraud case unfolding since 2016 in the northwest Shaanxi province and neighboring Hunan. Regulators found adulterated gold bars and 19 lenders' coffers backing 19 billion won of loans. In one case, a lender seeking to melt gold collateral found black tungsten plate in the middle of the bars. Okay, so... Again, there are ways to test this, and I'll, I'll speak briefly on it. In, case of, in the case of King Gold, the company said it took out loans against gold to supplement its cash holdings, support business operations, and expand gold reserves according to public records. In 2018, the company beat a number of competitors bidding to buy a controlling stake in the state-owned auto parts maker Tri-Ring Group. King Gold offered 7 billion won in cash for 99.97% of Tri-Ring. The Ube government cited the deal as a model of so-called mixed ownership reform, which seeks to invite private shareholders into state-owned enterprises. But King Gold has faced problems taking over Tri-Ring's assets amid a series of corruption probes and disputes involving Tri-Ring's. Um, again, he flatly denied it. Uh, Jia flatly denied it and said it was because some of the gold the company acquired in the early days had low purity. Um, low purity or no purity. This is no purity if you're just copper gilded with gold. Uh, in a telephone interview with Kai Xin in early June, Jia denied that the gold pledged by his company was fake. How could it be fake if insurance companies agreed to cover it, he said. 
and refused to comment further. That alone right there is pretty interesting. How could it be fake if insurance companies agreed to cover it? Well, it's because nobody's checking and even insurance companies might not be, be checking. And that's one of the key differences, again, between us, our vault, the safe house, and a lot of other vaults. Um, you guys who are storing in the safe house, I'm pretty sure you guys are feeling comfortable right now. Uh, seeing articles like this floating around, you know that when your gold and silver is with us, we test it. And again, you know, made, it was made mention here how um, the bar was tungsten. And if they did a test or a series of tests, at least two, preferably three tests, they would have found out. The test that would have found this out was ultrasound, which we use as part of our ducts testing. It's a trifecta of density, ultrasound, and x-ray tests to go ahead and um, look deeper into your bars of gold and silver. Ultrasound would have, would have showed that there is something else in, in the bar. It's not just made up of one metal. Uh, there, there would have been, um, it, it would have shown that there was another metal in there. X-rays, Understand this, guys. Whenever they pull out that x-ray gun, it's very thin. All they can really check is uh, a very thin layer of that gold. To um, to it, it, The x-rays can't penetrate fully through the gold bar. So if you do have a gold-plated bar, if it had a good amount of gold plate on it, x-ray tests might not show. So you can't rely just on that one test. If you do an ultrasound test, that will get through the bar. It'll send those sound waves through the bar. It'll reflect and bounce back up. And it's going to tell you by the speed of these waves moving if something else was in that bar. Uh, had they done that, they would know. And of course, density um, should be a, a certain weight, has a certain mass, and it should weigh a certain amount in a certain size. So this, even the, the density factor, had they done these tests, they would know. And, and again, this is important because People all throughout the world are, are storing gold and silver bars. And I, I'd say a good percentage of them, I, I'm just guessing here, probably over half, 60, 70, 75, 80%, I don't know, have not ever tested what they have stored in, in the vaults. They're going along with just the vault's word that this is real, this is true. And um, I can tell you, some guys want certificates. Certificates are just pieces of paper, easy to forge. Uh, especially with older bars, um, I believe a lot of the mints, they don't keep track of certificates. You know, if you were to call them back and say, I have certificate, you know, 3449278, you tell them that they may not be able to give you any information on it. There's no history of when that bar was made or uh, unless it has a date on it or the hands that it's passed through. There's no history of it. So really, certificate is just a piece of paper and it's the easiest component to forge as, as far as... um fake gold, fake silver. That's the easiest part. So would I personally rely on a certificate? <laughs> not at all. I, I would not rely on a certificate. The other part you see are monster boxes. They come strapped, right? And nobody ever opens it. They assume that if a strap is on it and that strap, you know, has U.S. Mint, U.S. Mint on it or Canadian Mint, Canadian, going round and round on that, that plastic box that it's never been opened they assume that it's it's true, and they will say, I want an unopened monster box. I, I want the seal to be intact. And it's fine. You know, I guess it gives them some level of uh, confidence. But the truth is, those straps can be counterfeited. Okay, You counterfeit the straps, you go ahead and just print U.S. Mint on it, whatever it is. You, you have the monster boxes, just go ahead and put something in. You give it the right weight, strap it up, make it look like it's never been opened. And you're relying on a strap, which can be counterfeited, or you're relying on a certificate, which can be counterfeited. So for guys who are storing in vaults, you, you need to know. Make sure your vault tests your gold and silver. And again, with us, we do a ducts test, density, ultrasound, x-ray. We do these tests on it. And again, we make sure it's real. We have to because... People who store with us, they use their gold and silver as collateral to go ahead and get uh, secured low interest loans. So guys who are loaning money, rest assured, the collateral is good. And guys who are storing with us, rest assured, 
the gold and silver is good. And in fact, I think we're one of the only guys who have a genuinity guarantee. If at all, for some reason, you know, you, you try to sell back your gold and silver and if it's found to be fake, that's on us. We, we will honor the transaction because we test everything and we're that confident. And insurance companies are that confident. We have even the uh, mysterious disappearance clause where if we play back all the tapes and we can't figure out what happened with the gold and silver, something is gone, let's say, we can't figure it out. Because of our systems, the way we do things, insurance companies will still cover it. And it's, uh, again, this is one of the differences between us and a lot of other vaults. If you don't store with us, consider it. If you're storing somewhere else, I would say demand that they uh, demand that they check your bar, your gold and silver. I mean, if they're charging you a storage fee to store gold and silver, then it better well be gold and silver that they're charging you for, right? I mean, that's that's just the way I look at it in a, a very simplistic way. So again, make sure that your gold and silver is being tested, especially as the prices rise. You're going to see more and more counterfeits coming up. So you need to make sure you already are with a dealer or a vault who is testing things. Okay, moving on. Uh, sorry about that, guys. It's just ultra important that, that we understand this. All of us understand this. Mount Printmore. Yeah, so I understand some people want to take down the faces on Mount Rushmore. I guess well, these are the guys that are we're going to replace them with, huh? Yellen, Bernanke, <laughs> Greenspan, and Powell. Well, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Okay, so a new face for Mount Rushmore there. We're going to call it Mount Printmore. Okay, let's do this. Are you in or are you out? Train is leaving. All aboard. Yeah, this has to do with, um. we saw some pretty good moves with, with gold and silver. Of course, it's going to move this week. It may go down a bit, may go up a bit. Nobody knows, but there is chaos in the gold market, and it's rippling to other precious metals. This is from the Straits Times over in Singapore. Let's take a look at this. The chaos that engulfed the gold market in March as the bug choked off physical trading routes. Remember that? We couldn't get any gold and silver for a while, right? Is rippling through other precious metals resulting in price dislocations and a surge in exchange inventories for silver and platinum. The gold market was thrown into turmoil in March as lockdowns grounded planes and closed refineries, leading traders to worry they won't be able to get their gold to New York in time to deliver against futures contracts. That caused futures, which typically trade close to London spot price, to soar to a premium, inflicting losses on banks that struggled to close arbitrage bets and spurred them to shift some positions out of New York futures. There are signs that the dynamic is not limited to gold. Silver and platinum futures have traded at elevated levels relative to spot metals since early April. And as in the case of gold, the premiums are spurring big increases in on-exchange inventories in New York. On Monday the 29th, the first notice data for the July silver contract. This is silver now. July silver contract on the COMEX in New York showed the largest single day of deliveries in almost 25 years. So guys are wanting to take delivery. Um, if you don't have your silver, maybe you should consider getting it because when they take delivery, they take huge amounts of silver, especially deliveries for platinum on the New York mercantile exchange were more than five times the next largest month this year. So silver and platinum. Those deliveries serve as a way for banks to reduce their exposure to price dislocations and limit risk. The blowout in gold spreads earlier this year led to big losses for some banks, which typically sell futures in the New York or in New York as a hedge for their positions in the London over-the-counter market. HSBC Holdings lost $200 million in a single day of trading, illustrating the challenges to banks due to the turmoil in the exchange for physical price or EFP. One more paragraph here. Silver and platinum have been seeing similar price differentials. 
The spread between silver futures and spot prices ended the second quarter at the highest in nearly four decades. Platinum's EFP spiked to the highest since early 2008, and Palladium had the highest spread on record dating back to 1993. So those metals looking good, silver especially. Uh, another one, we cannot control what the news puts out or the politics behind it because, let's face it, everything is biased, slanted. And safe haven assets like gold and silver are more important than ever. And this has to do, again, with the, um, the trade dispute, the relationship between U.S. and China. Um, why I put this out, I, I'm not going to get into the article, but why I put it out is because it is getting close to election time. And... Um, we're going to hear all kinds of things going on and we need to be able to see through it and think clearly, think critically through everything and hate to say it, but know where the bias is. Certain places they will bias this way, certain places they are going to bias the other way. So we have to understand what people are saying, why they're saying it and who they are affiliated with and that. Got to leave up to everybody else. Everybody makes up their own mind on this, right? Let them eat cake or brains. Take a look at one more here. This has to do with um, zombie companies. It seems to be growing more and more. Um, let's take a look. I'll check comments after this. See, you guys are pretty much having some conversations without me. Commentary. Don't let zombie companies eat up bailouts needed by businesses. The best way to help the economy is to either is either to let zombie companies resurrect themselves through the bankruptcy process or just return to the grave. And we've been talking about this. The Fed, the government, they're picking the winners and damning the losers. And the free market is not being able to choose or they're not getting any clarity which companies are worth uh, investing in on their own merits and which ones seem to be doing well on their balance sheets and whatnot because of the Fed intervening. Uh, nonetheless, governments are all deciding which struggling companies to help out. Okay, keyword, governments. Governments are all deciding which struggling companies to help out during the bug. Uh, among the many looking for help, some have a strange deathly halar. This has nothing to do with whether they trade in sectors who fu whose futures look very uncertain, though many do. For many years, these companies have been struggling, and this is true. For many years, these companies have been struggling. You can go back to QE1, QE2, and these companies are, are, are still struggling. They struggled then. They got all their money. Uh, the Fed bailed them out, and they're struggling again. So for years, these companies have been struggling to pay interest on their large debts, let alone the principal despite the long period of very low interest rates. Some were on their way to failure. The buoyant economy before the bug kept them just about stumbling along. And there are many of these zombies in our midst and whatever public, and this is the key part, whatever public money they receive, okay, whatever public money they receive means less available for firms that were healthy before the bug. And Morgan Stanley estimates that as many as 16% of companies are zombies. I've heard as high as over 20, uh, but this is their report. 16% of U.S. companies are zombies while there are plenty in Asia and Europe too. So it's not just a U.S. thing. Again, zombie companies are its something global. I, I believe in Europe, there's even quite a bit of, of zombie companies. So again, what happens is when the Fed, when the government, when they put money in, these companies might even be taxpayer money. Um, it, it's companies that perhaps should have been restructured or gone through bankruptcy and gone into the grave. But, you know, because of all this intervention, we're not getting any clarity. And that's that's a dangerous thing, you know, as far as trying to understand where to put your market. And, and that probably is the why we're, why we're seeing more and more people getting into gold and silver because where do you go? You know, where, where really do you go at this point? Um, you got to find that safe haven. So let me take a look at some comments out here. Um, let's see. Uh, Susan Klein, Fiat Bin Digital. Um, fiat, it's, it is digital in a sense, I guess, you know, when, whenever we use our MasterCard, Visa card, things like that, you know, it's, it is digital if you want to, um, if 
you look at it that way. Uh, but it's it's going to be taken even a step further where, and, and we've talked about this also, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, where you are having central banks, they, they are going to create their own, um, I don't know if you want to call it crypto, digital currency of sorts. And my understanding is they're even going to have to create wallets where, you know, you and I were going to have a wallet, maybe on our phone or whatever it is. And we may not have that, that physical cash anymore. It's just going to be a central bank digital currency. They're going to give us the wallets. They're going to know where all our money is, what we use it for. And it's the ultimate way for monetary policy, for central banks to implement monetary policy. They can throttle interest rates and you're going to be forced to react. Either you're going to be forced to spend because you're going to be losing value on your, your currency. Or, you know, if things are heating up too much, you know, they, they may want you to slow down and not spend so much. And you're going to see them see them raise interest rates, you know, so they can throttle interest rates, raise it, lower it. And you and I, we're going to have to react because we don't have that, that physical cash anymore. We're just going to watch whatever's in that wallet move up and down according to monetary policy. And it's not to mention even fiscal policy. What are governments going to do to, to get what they get what they want or need as far as um, having the economy move one way or the other. So in, in that aspect, you know, Suzanne Klein, I mean, it's what you brought up. It's, it's a good point. You know, it, it is digital. It's going to get even more digitally. It's going to get more digitally where it's, uh, we may not even have that, that physical cash anymore. So great, great comment there. Um, let's see. Um, what else is out there? Um, John Michael Karma, bias slanted, no way. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, that's uh, seemingly everything is nowadays, which is why it's important that we got to understand things. And as much as you don't want to, as much as it might pain you, you got to take in two sides. You, you, that's why we got two ears, right? You need to listen to these guys. You need to listen to those guys. And then your brain kind of figures it out, reasons it out, and and helps you to to decide. So anyway, getting back to um. A few more items back on, on Twitter here. So, yes, zombie companies, it, it takes away really money that could be spent in in more uh, productive means. William Middlecoop, when money dies, Ronnie Storfle, no further comment needed. Steve Nuchin, Jerome Powell, they are burying capitalism. And again, because they're intervening in the markets, you're not getting true capitalism anymore. And I think this uh, picture describes it perfectly. Jimmy Song, is it me or is anyone else noticing the price increases at the grocery store? This isn't just for meat either. It's everything. So are you guys noticing that? Um, Lomi Prince, kleptocracy. Again, this was about how the um, Fed is throwing money in, in, into companies that may not even need the money. Uh, so again, this is uh, this is clip, what kleptocracy looks like. Billionaire investor Chamath P blasted the Fed on buying foreign companies' bonds. So Fed is not just buying U.S. company bonds; it's buying foreign bonds. They were buying Toyota, UK giant BP, um, again German car makers Volkswagen and and Daimler. So this is what kleptocracy looks like. So he's he's making a point that the Fed. Pretty much in everything right now, and, and not just everything in the U.S., but everything all over the world. IMF says Asia's economy will shrink for the first time in living memory due to the bug. So the fund said Asia's economy is expected to contract by 1.6% this year. Um, so economies even all over the world are, are getting hit. Um, we got Batman. <laughs> you guys know I like Batman, so he's uh, playing his ukulele, and then he got interrupted. Uh, by Spider-Man, I believe. Spider-Man came by and played his own song. Let me just, I'll just play it for you. Get a little bit of a laugh. Batman! 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 Batman!
geez, sorry about that. That got kind of loud there. Okay, so let me end that one already. That horn was a bit loud. Sorry about that, guys. Um, let me get out of this. Okay. So, yeah, I just need a little bit of laughter. You guys, you guys know I like Batman already, right? He's Bruce Wayne. Okay, and then also we had the, the Fed. Um, one last article I'll, I'll share, and then we'll get to, to Ray Dalio, some clips from Ray Dalio. The Fed is buying some of the biggest companies' bonds, raising questions over why. So, again, we saw the Fed. They were not just buying foreign companies' Uh, bonds, but they're also buying, of course, U.S. companies and it's raising questions. Why? And the bonds that they're buying, Microsoft, Apple, Home Depot have been among the beneficiaries. We hear all the time Apple is, is holding such a huge cash position. Microsoft is, is doing well. Why is the Fed getting into these companies? So questions have been raised over moral hazard as the Fed buys debt from companies that don't seem to need the central bank's help. So again, you know, all these things that kind of makes you wonder why, kind of makes you wonder what's going on, kind of makes you wonder what's the value of money. And with that, I'll play a clip from Ray Dalio. What is the value of money? Value of money. What is the value of money? I mean, think about it in Europe, for example. Um, the central bank will lend to banks at a minus 1%. Um, and so that means you don't have interest payments. In fact, you have interest credits. And the central banks will take that debt on, they'll loan it. And they have a political agenda, not a economic agenda, in which um, they'll determine whether they'll be paid back or when they wanna be paid back based on how the economy is doing and what will happen. So in that case, like an example in Europe and the similar situations in the United States and Japan in varying degrees, they will make loans that will have um, interest credits almost, or let's say zero, you don't have to pay interest back. And you may not have to pay principal back. It depends on what the conditions are at the time. So those are more- Okay, we'll get more into Ray Dalio, but um, things like this, you know, it, it was one of the reasons at work this past week, there was some buzz about a, a TED talk that Ray Dalio was in a few weeks back. Uh, pretty interesting, he said, principle or interest there. And, you know, so because of that talk, you know, I, I wanted to take a look at some other things that Ray Dalio said on that fairly recent TED talk. Uh, and the title of this, um, that TED talk was what the bug means for the global economy. And he started off with saying that there are four things. So we'll get into the, the other half of the, the program now. There are four things that are the driving forces of our economy and our lifestyle and wealth. And the first and most powerful is, is, is productivity, which comes from people learning and inventing and doing things well, just as Marco described, okay? And it grows slowly. Grow, you know, one or two or 3% a year, it grows slowly and it's not volatile because knowledge isn't volatile but it grows and that raises our living standards over a period of time. Then there's a short-term debt cycle. The short-term debt cycle is, you know, recessions and expansions and booms and recessions that, that they last about eight, 10 years. And then there's a long-term debt cycle. And that long-term debt cycle, which goes on about once every 50 to 75 years, is when you begin a new type of money and a new type of credit. That began in 1945, the New World Order, at the end of World War II, were the, and with the Bretton Woods monetary system, created a new monetary system in 1945, a new money. So they wiped out pretty much the old money, or they largely disposed of it, and they began anew, and that's the New World Order, which was the American World Order, and we have seen it, and still 70% of the money and credit that exists in the economy is running by dollars. And what you have traditionally is the breakdown. And then the fourth influence is politics. And politics is largely how we deal with each other. Can, and, and there's internal politics and there's external politics. The internal politics is how do you deal with uh, the wealth gap? How do you deal with the values gap? Do you have a common mission? Do we have an American dream that we can agree on? 
and that we're pursuing that together? Or do you fight over wealth and, and so on? And so when you look at history, that's what revolutions are in their various ways. And there's always a revolution in one of these. Sometimes those are peaceful revolutions and so sometimes they're disruptive. In, like in, and, but it's a wealth ch shift in, in, that needs to take place. Okay, Ray Dalio, four points he, he uh, gave out. Again, this is from a, a TED Talk a, a few weeks back. Um, productivity, learning, doing, inventing grows slowly because knowledge is not volatile. Uh, that's true. You know, knowledge is not volatile. It takes time. It does take time. Um, Short-term debt cycle, recessions, expansions, etc., last about eight to ten years. And, and we, kind of, we kind of saw this, you know, Going back to January of this year, 2020, the U.S. was in its longest economic expansion in history. So, again, he, he nailed that. And uh, number three, point three, long-term debt cycle, 50 to 75 years, beginning a new type of money and credit, began in 1945. And the words he used, um, the words he used, the new world order. And that's coming from Ray Dalio, where he he would call it the new world order um, from Brenton Wood's point forward. And politics, largely how we deal with each other. And that is true also. I mean, you know, one, one thing you got to appreciate about Ray Dalio, um, he's, he's going to say things pretty much how, how he sees it um, in a very, um, in a very, I don't know if soft is the right word, but in, in a very realistic, sometimes even holistic way where, um, you know, it, it is it is what it is. And that's how he tends to look at things, which which is very fair, which is why he's good at moving either way, left, right, center, and, and just seeing things for what they are. Nonetheless, he did say, he talked about a wealth shift. A wealth shift does need to take place. and And this is something we spoke about last week as well, where... Our monetary system, it is going to change. It's going to change. The question is, will it change by evolution in a peaceful way or revolution, which might not, might not be as peaceful, maybe even a bit painless. Now, this change in the monetary system, this is the present. It's going to be the future, if you will. Now, staying with the present part, if you have to ask exactly where we are in this point in time, we hear words like expansion, uh, just as the beginning of the year, largest expansion on record. Now we hear other words like recession. We hear words like depression. Why do we need to know where we are exactly at this point in time? It's because history tells us the remedy for each of these is very different from the other. And this is uh, something that Ray Dalio talked about as well. So what do you mean by a depression? Okay. Something like happened in the 1930s. So just to repeat, 1929 to 1932, there was a fall in the economy and a very double digit unemployment rates and a magnitude of fall in the economy, like about 10%. Do I think we're in that? Yes. How was that dealt with? 1933, um, what they did is they printed a lot of money. Then, and the government came out with the same type of programs that we're having now. Yes, okay, same thing. Zero, interest rates hit zero, same thing. Okay, same dynamics. And then there is the, 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 that money causes an expansion from that point. How long does it take for the stock market to uh, exceed its highs? Or how long does it take for the economy to exceed its former highs? A long time. Okay, do I think that's what we're in? Yes, that's what we're in. We've seen that happen repeatedly in history. You saw so many, many times, it's just the most recent one. And there's a structure to that. So yes, this is not a recession. This is a breakdown, a, 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 an operation that I'm just describing in terms of how it's dealt with, the production of money and credit, and all of that. That's what we're in. Okay, so. The 33, in, or in 33, they printed a lot of money. This was around the time they even uh, expropriated, confiscated, however you look at it, gold. Government um, government came out with different types of programs, uh, similar programs that, that we are having now or that they plan to 
to bring in infrastructure type projects. Um, they're going to be a political weapon. I think we can all agree on this, especially coming toward um, election time. You're going to see everyone talking about jobs, jobs, jobs. Um, you know, in addition, the markets, the economy, they take a long time to get back to where they are. I'll give you an example. Um, yesterday, went out, went to a mall, <clears throat> stopped in a just a little restaurant, had something to eat. Half the tables are taped off. You can't go there. You can't sit there, which means the, le the restaurant has half as many tables as it once did, which means the customer volume is going to go down. And so you look at that straight away. Restaurants are not going to get back to where they were anytime soon. And on top of that, how does the restaurant going to make up for what they're losing? Uh, two ways. Either you got to promote hard on delivery, which means people aren't going to your restaurant, right? They're staying at home. Or they're going to charge the walk-ins a bit more. And um, people, put it this way, if they charge people more, people aren't going to come. So they're going to shoot themselves in, in the foot on that aspect of it. So it's almost as if, you know, looking at it from that point of view, why, why even have a restaurant already just go online and, and deliver food if, if that's, you know, one way that you want to try and stay afloat. But just trying to say that seeing this, the economy is not going to come back anytime soon. I mean, if, like I said, if you're that restaurant, <laughs> you're not getting as many people as, as you got in there. And you may have to charge people even more, which is going to make people not come to you for food as much as well. So, um, no, economy is not coming back anytime soon. Even if they open up, it is going to take a while, just as, uh, just as Ray Dalio said. However, this is not a recession. The words used were a breakdown. This is a breakdown. We are simply producing money and credit. That breakdown um, first surfaced last year when we saw the repo market explode. Um, that's, I think, when we look back in history, we're going to go back to that point in time uh, with what happened with, with the repo markets. And, and early on, you know, if you folks were with our live stream from back then, every day we were checking the, the repo markets and we were seeing these numbers rising. And then um, they were even starting to rise quite a bit in mortgage-backed securities. And I think, you know, when we look back in history, that is going to be another point in time where things surfaced and was tried to... Um, they're trying to bury it as, as quick as, as they could. But in part, producing this money and credit is what is getting people, some businesses, even countries, both worried and upset, upset with what is going on. If you're not in the club where your business is, frankly speaking, not getting bailed out, and, and we saw that, why is the Fed bailing out Apple, Microsoft, all these big guys who don't need bailing out, or maybe bailing out is not the right word, but why is the Fed injecting money? to these big companies, right? Well, they're in the club, I suppose. But if you're not in that club, you find the gap getting wider and wider, or you feel perhaps under the thumb of the government or, or even the nation. And at some point, at some point, a challenge is going to be issued. At some point, a challenge is going to be issued. And you have a situation when there's a rising power challenging existing power there is competition and there is a risk of war. And so how they deal with each other, so that they're, whether there's a greater good or whether they are um, fighting with each other is the defining moment. There are always stress tests, these big stress tests that come along once about once every 75 years and, and when they happen. And this is a stress test. And I think that what you're going to see is uh, as, how we deal with each other. There's enough wealth to go around, but what do you do when you're outside the ring of support, uh, let's say of the, of the US dollar? And what, what is that gonna be like for those entities? Or if you're within the ring of support, how will that bill be divided? And how will we be with each other? I think we're gonna have to reconsider who has what. Yeah, that's a good point that we're going to have to reconsider who has what. And I found it interesting that the, the way he said it, it can apply to to a nation's citizens, which is what we're seeing with a lot of challenge going on. It can relate to corporate where, you know, challenging to, to stay afloat right now. And, and are you going to get help or not? And it even can relate to, to different nations, different countries where 
that dollar sometimes is, is weaponized. Is it a good idea to stay on the U.S. dollar or not? So there are going to be challenges on all fronts. There's going to be challenges from your own citizens, challenges from businesses in your own country, businesses abroad, and there's going to be challenges even from different nations. So a lot of challenges are, are ahead for sure. And this is what we are seeing, not just in a micro outlook, but a global macro outlook as well. Citizens, again, are challenging government, nations challenging other nations, and it seems most, if not at all, or not all of it, a lot of it has to do with central banks, what they're doing or even what they're not doing, who they favor. And this is why the current monetary system, whether you and I are ready or not, it's indeed going to change. And as mentioned, they are already talking about central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. If they're talking about it now, probably means they're three quarter ways through development or, or something like that. They're not going to talk about it unless they know for sure it's it's going to happen and and all systems are go. So change is coming and Dalio speaks on this as well. I did a, a study which is on LinkedIn if anyone wants to see it. And it takes um it goes back five hundred years and it shows um um real GDP, in other words, the economic activity going back there. And, and there's a line. And you don't see these depressions, as we're calling them, even on that line. They barely wiggles. When you go into it and you look at the that piece, that's what it looks like. GDP falls 10 percent, unemployment goes up, it, and it passes. And because the greatest force is the force of adaptation and inventiveness if we can operate well together. So that's what I think it's going to look like over this period of time. It'll pass. It, the world will be very different. There'll be a new world order. But it will pass and will be inventive because what we're dealing with now is just money and credit. Money and credit is just digital. I mean, there's no, there is real good services. You know, those are real. But everything else is just accounting. And so when you change the digits and you work those things out and you work yourself through, that takes you know a couple of years at most kind of, and then you come back into a restructured environment. Okay. Um, what I found interesting there was <clears throat> in a prior clip, he said New World Order referring to Bretton Woods. And then he said it again, referring to when we come out of this, which means another new world order in, in his view, or he's going to see things that are greatly, greatly different, which again means some type of a, could it mean some type of a wealth transfer where again, wealth protection, we, we need to understand wealth protection. We need to understand how are we going to transfer our money today to, to tomorrow because of this, these changes take place, especially with the monetary system. You need to have things that are going to be able to transfer, transport your money from today to tomorrow. So he's, he's making some great, great points again there. On a global scale, it is true the U.S. weaponizes the U.S. dollar, the world's reserve currency. And it is true that, therefore, naturally, other countries will, will want to get away from the dollar. And the key in this, though, as Ray Dalio says, adaptation and inventiveness is is the key in these things um, but how much can you adapt and how inventive can you can you be when let's say as we we spoke on earlier you're just starting up you need some funding but money is going into other places it's going into dead companies zombie companies when perhaps you have something that could save the world so to speak and you're not getting funded for it and, and, and again, this is why that free market needs to exist. If companies need to go bankrupt, so be it. They go bankrupt, they may restructure, they may have new management, new organizations, new operations, whatever it is. And maybe they'll come back out better and stronger. If they don't, then you will probably have a competitor to fill in the void, fill in that vacuum, a competitor which will, which will get better, uh, which will do things better, which sees all the 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 pitfalls and everything else and then he will reshape restructure reorganize and, and get better to fill in that that vacuum that was left by a company that went bankrupt so again we need the free market the fed intervening is you know i mean it's again keeping zombie companies alive keeping 
it's having money flow into places that might be better, uh, might be better suited, you know, that money should be flowing into other places. So, you know, again, you know, Dalio is, is, is on point there and we need to work together. Uh, this is true guys. We need to work together somehow, some way, because one way or another, again, there's going to be change. Change is going to happen to currencies all across the globe. Don't think that, um, just because your government may be, you know, fiscally responsible that you're not going to be affected. Uh, it's going to happen all across the globe. The question is, will there be a safe haven in any currency when these changes come? Will there be a safe haven when these changes come? And one reason that change is going to come is because of debt. There is basically a sort of some systemic shocks that the market hasn't yet fully seen perhaps to do with the inability of some players to handle the extreme levels of debt that are piling up right now as people can't work? Um, yeah, I, 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 I can't speak for what everybody's thinking out there. The, you know, the markets are off depending on what market and depending on what country you're in, you know, something in the vicinity of 25 to 45 or 50 percent, depending what currency you're managing in. And, and so if you're talking about emerging markets, they are worse because they're not going to get as much and so on. I can describe what I see. OK, we see something like 20 trillion dollars of uh, losses. OK, we see. So um, there if, if you work that through and you say you don't have money, and you don't have credit, your business can fail. Um, you know this, we see this all around us. So there can be failures when there can't be payments. And so the question is who gets what check to make those payments and get past it? But we're gonna have a giant restructuring of the, of the IOUs and we're gonna work out when hospitals um, are, can go broke because this is terribly costly for hospitals. And they will not fully recover their losses. Hospitals will go broke, even though we know that they need them. So when you go, you have to go entity by entity through this, and then you'll go through the process of who will pay. So this is not, you know, some people mistake this as um, there is a, a, a virus, and the virus may come and go, okay? Maybe we never see it again. I don't think that's likely, but I mean, the people who tell me say, but who knows? But if it never came back again, there will be those who are broke and, and, and who will have loss of income. We're gonna change how we operate in a, in a way. The, the supply lines are gonna change. In other words, self-sufficiency. What is self-sufficiency now going to mean? Do we have enough of this and that? We're gonna restructure our economy and restructure the financial system in ways that we mean we are not gonna go back to the way it was. Well, we're not going to go back to the way it was. Uh, supplies, uh, I think, um, lesson learned from what happened with the bug. You, you got to have a manufacturing base. You got to be able to to produce. You you can't um, you can't rely on any one or two or, or three countries anymore. You you need to your country needs to be um, self sufficient in in some way. And and I think this is very different from protectionism. Uh, this is very different from from that type of a uh, that type of an outlook. Um, interesting thing though, he did say entity by entity and, and he spoke about hospitals going broke. Well, if we look at entity by entity, and I could be wrong, but a hospital, let's just say, has bills covered by patients and patients have their bills covered by health insurance. So if hospitals went broke, I would think it's because of insurance companies that are getting obliterated, annihilated, and um, you know, when, when the bug first came out, we talked about how we need to keep an eye on insurance companies or the insurance industry, not just for bug issues, but because they also do things like underwriting. And, you know, it, it goes far beyond the scope that I think any of us could, could ever imagine. But again, if, if he's going to talk about hospitals going broke, I think we rise up a little and take a little bit broader view looking down we're going to see that if hospitals went broke it's because insurance companies went broke or are having a hard time 
And before this is over, if that so-called second wave hits, let's not just keep an eye on insurance companies, but let's keep both eyes on insurance companies. And I'll tell you why. Because what we saw happen with AIG back in 2008, AIG pretty much, I'll just say this, was the linchpin that would have brought the whole house of cards down if it were not bailed out. That was back in 2008. So how do we compare with the economic financial system to or the financial situation in 2008? So let's see what uh, Ray Dalio has to say. How do we compare with 2008? This is bigger than what happened in 2008. I'll distinguish it. In, in, in 2008, we had banks. It, it, it's the same thing, meaning you have a certain amount of leverage. Things go down. Too much leverage means you're broke in the counting terms. So then you look around and you say, who are the systemically important entities that you don't want to go broke? Because do you want to lose those banks at this time? And then you can make up money and make up credit and you can keep them alive in some way. And you did it with banks and through the banks, there were the mortgages and that's what it looked like. This is more complex than that because there are the banks and then there are those, all of those that are beyond banks. All of the little businesses, all of those in all the different places that are beyond it. And it's a bigger crisis and we have a less effective monetary policy because interest rates declines have reached their limit. And just buying financial assets by the central bank and buying the normal financial assets won't work. They have to buy the debt of the government and the government or the many governments have to be effective in getting buying power and production to those who need it around the world. Okay, so just curious, what, what are you guys making of this so far, of what he's saying? I mean, should the Fed be, um, are there too big to fail companies? We learned back in 2008, there were too big to fail banks, and now we're seeing too big to fail companies. So what do you, what's your guys' take on this? I mean, should some companies, um, given the green light to stay afloat. Um, he's also talking about things like, um, again, going back to uh, another new world order. He said it back in Brenton Woods, and then he's, he's saying, it, you know, there's going to be another one, another change. Um, so just curious what, what do you guys um, think about this? Um, let's see. Suzanne Klein, um, second stage is food shortages on a massive scale, I, I believe. Well, we did see some. Uh, there were reports of food shortages uh, a month or so ago, two months ago. But now we're seeing how um, food is getting a bit more expensive. So, you know, if if not a shortage or if a shortage or whatever it may be, food is also seemingly being more expensive. And, and I think it's it's worldwide. It's not just a, it's not just a U.S. thing. Uh, food shortage shortage can be a very very real thing rolf steiner empires fall and that is true so i mean you you gotta wonder again um challenges do happen challenges do do arise it doesn't always have to necessarily be be war um i i hope you know i, I really don't want to have to go down that road i don't think any of us do uh but you know, the thing is, there are challenges that are going to come about. And it's not just challenges within your own company. It's it's challenges economically with businesses in, in your own country, along with the people in your country. And then it's also challenges with other countries. And in the U.S. case, because it is the world's reserve currency or has the world's reserve currency, they are going to get more challenges and be challenged more than any other country. And it could very easily you know, be something where, you know, it's it's everyone against it or some against it, some not against it. And, you know, but the um the thing is, you know, it, it's got to do with money. Money has got to do with people's livelihoods. I mean, it, it deals with jobs and people's livelihoods. So governments are going to get pressured um, both from their own citizens and they're going to get pressured from other countries as, as well. So um, I, I tell you what, it's, very interesting times in, indeed. I just um, just hope that some positive change can come out of this where we have an evolution. Things evolve and evolve for the better. 
But as Dalio said, this is more complex than in 2008. There are the banks, yes, and then there are those beyond the banks, which is what we're seeing with, with corporate, with companies. And we have a less effective monetary policy because interest rates have reached their lower limits. Lower limits being zero, the only place else it can go now as far as lower limits would be negative. Uh, so we have less effective monetary policy, and it's been at these lower bounds for for quite a while already, and that is part of the reason why people took on more risk. They're trying to find more more yield. So central bank definitely um, is playing a role in um, in this where companies have to go looking for, for more yield. A lot of it had to do with pensions. People were promised pensions. They needed to get 7%, 8% or more, and so they had to take on riskier riskier assets, riskier bonds. So again, the Fed had a lot to play in this. And central banks buying financial assets will not work. Central banks have to buy government debt or many government debts. Notice how he said many government debts to get effective buying power and production to all corners of the globe. And I'd imagine he said that because the U.S. is, I think it's still the largest uh, consumer country. And, you know, I'm, Take this in a positive way. It has put a lot of people to work. I mean, the world has put a lot of people to work. Uh, but, you know, because it is a consumption economy, other countries produce. And when they produce, they employ people. People have jobs. They have livelihoods. And, and you know, it is because of bigger consumption-type economies. But this is more complex than, than 2008. And it, it has to do with, countries all over the world and people just the everyday working average joe all over the world because of consumption economies that the world has turned to debt-based monetary systems but a natural question at this point is as an investor what do i do and i saw that in one of the comments <laughs> where do you put your money if we're hearing what central banks are doing and uh, it's not working and money is just digital accounting the monetary system is going to change. So what do we do? Where, where, do we, where do we put our money? What the uh, individual investor needs to do is know how to diversify well. So the word that I would know how to diversify well and in a balanced way. The greatest mistake of all investors is to think that what has done well lately is a better investment rather than more expensive. And the greatest, and what is done worse lately is the worst investment, get me out of it, rather than it's cheap. And unless you know how to deal with the differences of those, which most people don't, they're gonna be in trouble. So understand that wealth, total amount of wealth in the world essentially doesn't change very much, okay? And that one thing goes up, another thing goes down. And to know how to diversify, to diversify it in asset classes, to diversify it in countries, um, to diversify it in currencies, to know how to diversify that well so that you have wealth diversification is important. Do not think that cash is a safe investment. When you, most people think, look, I just want safety. And those bonds aren't given, give me an interest rate and so on, so where do I get safe? Cash is a seductive investment because it doesn't have as much volatility, but it taxes you and your buying power about 2% a year. And, so, uh, and that, so cash is almost always the worst investment. So you have to think about that. You should think a little bit unconventionally. Do you have a little bit of gold? Do you have a little bit of um, asset, in case this monetary system breaks down and money's redefined, do you have a little bit of that? I can't get into all the different ways that one can diversify well. I try to convey those things in my books or my, or, uh, you know, on posts, uh, uh, posts on LinkedIn particularly. Um, but, I, but I would say diversify well, be humble, don't market time, and be conscious of the dangers of cash. Okay, diversify your wealth, diversify locations. Uh, do not think that cash is a safe investment. I'm glad that this week it's not me saying it, it's someone else. It's Ray 
Thalio. So he is he is saying these things as well. Um, <clears throat> cash expiration date. I think most of us know this. It does have a or will have an expiration date. Um, diversifying your wealth. Um, he's he's talking again. We don't offer any financial advice, professional or, or otherwise, on, on this channel. Nothing should be taken as that. It's just opinions. It's just what we do, I do, or, or what people do. So understand that part. Diversifying your wealth. Um, eggs all being in one basket. Uh, be careful with that. Diversify locations. And this is something we, we talked about before. It's not enough to diversify your assets or your wealth. You also need to diversify the locations of your wealth for a lot of different reasons. Um, one, it helps you be mobile. If you need to uproot and move, you have something in other jurisdictions. Um, that's the, the key thing also, jurisdictions. Sometimes, you know, being here in Singapore, the jurisdiction of Singapore, it's good, but it's not enough. And what I mean by it's not enough is if you have, uh, let's say, a, a, if you're dealing or with a company that has U.S. entities and the U.S. wants something in, uh, in Singapore, if they can't get it through Singapore, they will start to strangle the other entities throughout the world to get the entity in, in the U.S. entity in Singapore perhaps to, to comply, which is why if, let's say, you do um, store perhaps in Singapore, gold and silver, it's best to have or uh, best to store with a company that is entirely Singapore owned and operated, no U.S. entity, no other country entity. I mean, even if you're you're in a different country, uh, I mean, um, let's say you have uh, you're storing here, there, here, there, all different countries. You are now subject to all those different jurisdictions, and each jurisdiction has it, its own level of of security or or reach, and which is why you know Singapore, the government is good. They're they're going to help you. I shouldn't I take that back? They're not going to help you. The government is good in that it the jurisdiction is favorable to you. Okay, so take that back. They're not going to help you. The jurisdiction is favorable. Okay, but again, if you're Singapore owned and registered, it's it, it also helps you in a sense that um, you will not necessarily have another country come in and try to um, try to uh, let's say um, enforce their rule on you because you are now with Singapore. So that's that's a good thing about it. So the jurisdiction of, of Singapore. Um, it is favorable in, in that sense. Okay, so take that back. Now, government is not going to help you. It's just that the jurisdiction is, is in your favor. Okay, so got ahead of myself there. So diversify your wealth, the location, and, and do not think cash is a safe investment. You know, cash has an expiration date. And again, this is coming from Ray Dalio. So I just want to close up with a few comments. Other than to say, I really have no comment. I mean, after looking at Ray Dalio's clips, because it kind of leads me to think, as, as I hope it does for you as well, it leads me to think about the changes that will come and are coming. Have I understood the degree of these changes, what they're going to bring? Am I positioned to get through that monetary system and wealth transfer? Do I fully understand that cash has an expiration date? Am I mentally prepared to battle through things or is fear taking over? Um, can I or will I recognize the opportunities that that lie ahead? So I'll play one last clip from from Ray Dalio for you. Most people are most of those in the have have a particular are in a war of some kind or have a particular object, objective, and that the information that comes out even in the in the media, in uh, you know you could almost see which side uh, each media outlook or each person on how many people do you really believe don't have a side almost almost everybody has a, they're on one side or another side and the idea of being able to see things from both sides and come together is in this time and through history uh, perceived as almost being uh, weak or um, a threat because you got to get on one side or the other side and so on. And so it's not easy. 
Okay. And and I think what he said is the key. I mean, we have to see through things, see through what the media says, no matter which side you're on and what our leaders say, no matter who you're for or, or not for, and what the economy is saying, no matter what you're hearing or, or not hearing, it matters, I guess, in that aspect is, is what you're seeing. Not to say that we have to doubt everything. That's that's not the point here. We we don't have to doubt everything. It's just to say that we need to think. Think a bit critically on things. Uh, make the best decisions today to put you in a, a better place tomorrow. And that's what really um this one is about. I, I know things things are getting heated all over the place. And sometimes you, you got to step back, understand, you know, who you're listening to, the news you're, you're getting to, the bias, the slants, um, you know, stock market saying, hey, great, we're doing well. These companies are doing great. But, you know, as I said before, when an economist says recovery, I say run because there's no recovery without the Fed pumping up assets again and reinflating things. And um, so, you know, it's not easy. Just as Ray Dalio said, it's not easy, but we have to um, take a step back as, as, as much as we can possibly do and start to sift things out, you know, separate the, the shaft and find out, you know, what's true, what's not true, um, what hard to do. We're all, we're all biased in, in some ways, um, that's for sure, uh, definitely for, for sure. Uh, let's see, Rolf Steiner, the scale and... The scale of the fraud and corruption is totally in the open now, and that's a good thing. You know what? I, I'd have to agree with that, Rolf. I mean, you know, this perhaps is why there's there's a divide, because it's out in the open, and some things are going to benefit you, even if you um, don't agree morally, ethically with it, and some things are not going to benefit you. And, you know, it comes down to each person's choice. I mean, sometimes we're we're going to look with one eye or turn the other way if it benefits us. But, um, you know, I, I guess it's just human nature. How else can you say it? You know, we're, it's, it's human nature. But the thing is, there is anything, you know, over the past three, four years, um, a lot of things have been exposed where, you know, we, you, you really see the bias in things and that, if anything, it's, it, it's a good thing. So, you know, try and find some some positive in that because what we're seeing it's going to help us make decisions, and and that's that's for sure. We're going to be able to um make more clear decisions because of everything that that we're seeing uh, right now. Magic man looks like five trillion printing is coming around the corner. Nothing solved so far. Yeah, you know we're at what seven seven point something trillion, and I think guys are already seeing now ten twelve trillion maybe by the end of the year. And again, it's not just the U.S. thing. You know, we're seeing the Fed throwing money all over the world, whether it's uh, through swaps, um, buying up foreign company bonds. Um, it's just incredible with, with what they're doing right now. And, and not to mention, you know, even just the domestic bond market, you know, what's going on with that. And at some point, you know, people are just not going to believe this anymore. And, um, you know, the things that are probably going to come out of it is you're going to see infrastructure type jobs that are definitely going to be politicized because the economy is not going to come back anytime soon. A lot of jobs aren't going to come back. People are going to need these jobs. I talked about that restaurant scenario. Um, you're going to see this and it's going to be politicized or else you're going to see the, the fed or the government, uh, extending PPP and people being able to, uh, stay home and get unemployment for a longer period of time, or maybe, make it more money, a larger amount that people are getting. I mean, people do need relief. That's, that's for sure. But, um, long-term, maybe even midterm, what, what are the, the consequences going to be? And, um, something we all got to take a look at. All got to take a look at and, and understand. Um, let's see. Um, what else is out here? Desmond Cahill. <clears throat> What's the next black swan? It could be anything. Uh, war has always been thought of as a black swan. Um, South China, it's Mr. A is telling you how it will affect physical. Okay, again, with war, it's always, it's never going to be a black swan. Everybody knows, knows there's always possibility of war anywhere in the world. South China Sea, 
decades. It, there's decades, you know, ships moving in and out, this and that, this and that. Mediterranean, same thing. Gulf, you know, Persian Gulf, same thing. Um, it's it's always there, you know. Um, it's it's always there. So you know, what would it do to silver and gold price? To me, that part's a good question because the thing is. I would have expected, you know, with the turmoil in the Middle East, oil, all these things, I would have expected gold and silver to rise. In normal times, it would have. But today or lately, not so much. For some reason, it doesn't move with the news of, of war as much as it used to. So that, that part's a, a good question. Um, you know, what, what would happen with silver and, and Yeah, sorry about that. Something something happened, got cut off. Anyway, I guess um I guess that means end this thing. But you know, again, to me, silver and gold, it's not the price, it's the insurance that it brings. Um, you know, we're talking about all this monetary change and whatnot. Um, you gotta have some type of wealth insurance or something to to transfer your your money. So again, I'm not really as far as what happens with silver and gold price, I would expect it to go up, but um for me it's more about the the change. I mean the um yeah, the monetary change. So anyway, I guess with that, I, I should be ending it. It's about the wealth protection, uh, being able to transfer over from this monetary system to, to the next. That's that's what I'm talking about. Sorry about all, all the glitching. Um, started off with a glitch. I guess it's going to end with a with a glitch. So um, I don't know. I guess I better end it. But you guys take care. I hope your 4th of July weekend, your Canada Canada Day went well. Um, if you have questions, contact us, sales at Bullion dot com dot sg if you have questions about gold silver singapore even um, whatever it may be just go ahead and email us and, and we'll get back to you but you guys take care um and hopefully technical difficulties aside we'll, we'll see you next week as always silver up for or saddle up for what's coming ahead and silver up as well i'll see you guys next week take care